I would request the chairperson to please unmute and switch on the cameras. And starting with Dr. Devendra Venkatramani, over to you, sir. Thank you, Aisha. Um, it's a pleasure to be in any type of AIOC, whether it's a virtual or a physical meeting. But I'm sure all of us are me missing meeting physically. But at the same time, let's make the most of this platform that has been um, <laughs> so well organized by the AIOC team. So um, our invited course is on what after residency. And uh, today, in, in today's instruction course, we have a veritable smorgasbord of speakers and talks, which I'm sure will interest any uh, resident who is currently doing the residency and as well as those who are far off from their residency and are now even probably into practice. We're trying to cover a lot of topics to look at um, scope of continued ophthalmic education as well as making most of your fellowship and opportunities abroad. So uh, without further ado, I'll invite our first speaker, Dr. Akshay Nair. Dr. Akshay Nair is a well-known academic and oculoplastic surgeon. Uh, he's based in Mumbai. He's done his DNB from Shankar Netralai and his fellowship in oculoplastic surgery from um, L.B. Prasad Eye Institute, followed up by a very prestigious fellowship through the International Council of Ophthalmology in uh, New York, USA. So he's going to be talking to us about the ICO and the entire gamut of uh, services and that it offers over to you. Thank you, Devendra, for that introduction. And like I said, it's always uh, good to, like you said, it's always good to see uh, this uh, the post in co instructors of this course, it's always a good, uh, it's always good catching up with all of us. Uh, so, I will be talking about ICO examinations, fellowships, and the routes and ways to reach and achieve your fellowship and your uh, complete your examinations, and also a little bit of my own experience. Give me a second. All right. So why think of the ICO examinations? The ICO examinations essentially is a very objective and robust assessment examination. So you get to know how you stand in terms of uh, your level of knowledge and your competence in, in, in uh, understanding the questions and answering them, which are very, very basic and core to ophthalmology. It also gives you an assessment of where you are in terms of, uh, in comparison to your peers, uh, it may increase your job opportunities because as, as uh, you know, the ICO examinations keep uh, opening up newer vistas, you can probably go higher in, the, in, in terms of achieving more degrees using ICO as the uh, starting board. And of course, uh, you know, some, of, some people like to take an exam and also we love initials after our name. So all of these things are offered by the ICO. And in many ways for a resident, appearing for the ICO in their first or second year of residency is a good way to make sure that you actually end up studying uh, during your residency. Now, more importantly, the ICO has a reciprocity with the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh since 2018. Uh, and the website says, I quote, this partnership will ensure that a route from ICO to MRCS Edinburgh is seamless and opens the door for candidates to sit in the part C examination of the FRCS Edinburgh, which is the highest standard of attainment of the oldest and most prestigious Royal College of Surgeons. So how does that work? This is a, a slightly complex uh, algorithm that they have put in their website, which basically means that 2018 onwards now, if you completed your IC, uh, 2019, sorry, your ICO, visual sciences, uh, optics and refraction and clinical ophthalmology, and now you, even you're advanced, uh, you are good to, uh, you know, I, I, if you finish your clinical ophthalmology, then if you give your advanced, you are equivalent to a MRCS ED. And of course, if you complete your four years of clinical practice and the uh, FRCS Viva face to face, then you are automatically eligible for an FRCS Edinburgh. So uh, instead of what was earlier, your FRCS part A and part D have now been replaced by your ICO examinations, or they are equivalent to that. 
When we talk about ICO fellowships, there are three different types of fellowships that we're talking about, a three-month, a six-month, and a one-year fellowship. And again, the ICO examinations are, uh, uh, it is recommended that you have, a, you know, you sit for these examinations and clear them, uh, which gives you a better chance of being awarded a fellowship. Although it is technically possible to uh, be awarded fellowships even without having appeared for ICO exams, but this used to be case about five, seven years ago. Over the past few years, uh, the number of candidates taking these exams are so high that almost all applications for fellowship are from people who've already taken and cleared these examinations. Uh, so to summarize, it's, you know, you get the post-nominal FICO, you could possibly be getting better job opportunities because you've cleared your FICO and navigating through FRCS, like I mentioned, especially FRCS Edinburgh is easier. But you need to know that the examination doesn't allow you to practice in any country. It's not a licentiate examination, unlike uh, the MRC of or the FRC of, sorry. Uh, and also, uh, ICO fellowships, like I said, can be possible without the examination. At the end of the day, each of these three examinations, the basic, the clinical, and the advanced, are expensive. So you need to make a, 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 complete, a good decision before committing to it. So which are these exams? There is the visual sciences part A, the optics refraction part B, the clinical sciences part C, and advanced. And now, of course, subspecialty. And I'll go through each of them in a bit. So the visual sciences, like most ICO examinations, are held twice a year, whereas in March and October, it is basically an entry-level examination which residents can appear during their residency, typically in their second year. It is 120 questions and MCQ based with four choices. The subjects are uh, typically related to what you have been reading in the first year of residency. Special focus on neuroanatomy because a few questions are always asked from that, and this is something that residents tend to be out of touch with, given that this is not something that they've read since their anatomy of first year medicine. Also, it is important to brush up on epidemiology genetics as well. Your part B, which is combined with, which can be combined with part A, is on optics, refraction and instruments. And it is again an MCQ based examination with 60 questions and four choices, lasting for one and a half hours. They're usually held on the same day on in, in the split up together. Now you need to know that you have to uh, obtain passing marks in part A and part B separately to be eligible to applying for part C. And if you do not get the marks required to pass in any of these two uh, parts, you can reappear for each of the parts that you failed in individually later on. Then of course we come to clinical science. Now this is something again like held twice a year, but it is a mid-level examination. Basically it uh, is based on your knowledge of complete ophthalmology. As you can see the subjects that are covered in this. It's a good idea to appear for this examination just after residency when you're fresh with knowledge when you've just read your uh, you know, Kansky and Parsons or any other book that you, you referred to during your residency. Again, it's a MCQ based questions. Uh, question paper and uh, you have to give your single best response and finally the advanced examination now advanced is usually after residency or during fellowship or after fellowship it tests your competence and technical ability at the end of the day it it, it does not verify your training or test practical competence because it's not going to check how well you're operating or how you're able to diagnose it is a good judge of your theoretical and analytical skills they have a, what is called 10 extended matching type of questions and 75 context setting description. It sounds a little difficult, but they basically what they mean is that there will be either a visual photograph, an investigation, a graph, like an, uh, you know, an OCT or a top, topography picture or something. And there will be four statements associated with that and you need to choose the single best answer. Now they have the new subspecialty examinations which are available in seven specialties cornea, glaucoma, retina, oculoplastics, neuro-ophthalmology, pediatric services, and uveitis. Each of these have an, a section on cataract attached to it because the ICO believes that is basic knowledge that everybody should know. The, the requirement is that you need to have a, a cleared your, your advanced examination and you should have a high level of clinical experience, uh, one year of clinical experience 
this examination <laughs> is two hours long, and there are eighty context-setting description against like I like like I mentioned that type of question, the uh, questions with pictures and graphs and investigations. Now, how do you how much does it cost and how do you pay for it? This is how it is. So. you know typically if you are planning to go through just the visual sciences the uh, clinical sciences and the uh, advanced that alone will cost set you back by nearly close to uh, three one and three quarters of a lakh so it is it is quite an amount what do you, what do you what what do you refer to and what can you read before studying and i suspect a lot of this is going to overlap with what dr devendra and dr rohan will say because at the end of the day good sources of material for examination tend to remain the same so for basics and sciences we you know the essential reading that the icu themselves recommend is clinical optics by elkington and the mcqs from john ferris's book of mcqs in basic sciences often times are repeated verbatim in the question paper so it is it always helps to have read it and understood your answer before Uh, before appearing for the actual exam where you see the same question other good equivalent books are theory of practice uh, theory and practice of optics and refraction by a professor kurana and the i basic sciences in practice by forrester for your advanced for your clinical sciences uh, the the recommended reading is the in massachusetts i n year infirmary review and kansky now this is what kansky's cover was when we uh, took the examination of course you have now the fancier edition uh, of kansky so now talking about icu fellowships uh, i'll mention about what are the types of fellowship like i already mentioned there are basically three types there is a three month a six month and a one year as you can see there are sub specialty three month fellowships as well like focusing on retinoblastoma on uveitis on glaucoma on eye cancer so uh, with all due respect uh, i request you to please wrap up in next 30 right. seconds no we are actually have we've kept 35 minutes for yeah, panel we'll discussion it's a long time for panel oh. discussion so we have so, no panel here so we can continue we'll extend the timing for no worries okay if all of you agree okay yeah, no worries right. but thank you uh and also you have one year research fellowships like the icu retina research one year helmerich fellowship or the fred hollows fellowship and ocular genetics uh, these sub specialties are typically for people who already uh, you know uh, are into sub specialty practice for a resident or a fellow just after training a three month fellowship is very good which is why i'll focus mainly on that there are about 60 to 90 such fellowships awarded each year the award carries with it a 6000 dollar uh, grant which is supposed to cover a uh, student based expenses expenses for 3 months and uh, possibly your travel as well uh, your main minimum requirement is that you should have completed your uh, residency and are registered as a qualified ophthalmologist they are given strictly to people under the age of 40 and the condition that they say is that you must return to your home after training to resume your previous position so in your application form it's important to make sure that this is clearly explained the application process itself is very transparent because you have the ic of icoph.org which is the uh, icu examination uh, website where there is a very clear process like it shows the steps are first is to select your fellowship which one you are applying for uh, complete the eligibility check where you are expected to submit your documents excuse me where they check if you are eligible for the fellowship and let you know this has a quick turnover time in in, in less than a, a week sam you will get your decision once your eligibility is cleared you can then choose a host training center they have a list of centers which are icu affiliates in their <coughs> directory and you can apply to them your application process and your documents are directly submitted via the icu to the host and if the host accepts it you get to know soon if the host declines you have the option of choosing another host uh and finally when they accept it then you match the icu processes your uh, fellowship application and then you will be notified of the date for starting once it is once you start your fellowship <coughs> there is an a process to complete it following which you receive your certificate but if your application process is not completed and the icu rejects it you cannot apply again so that's important to know 
what if you want to go to a center which is not in their list of uh, directory of training centers you can actually write to them and let them know they are quite flexible in allowing that as well so there are multiple things that you need to think of before choosing an ico fellowship either a 3 month 6 month or a 1 year how useful would it be <coughs> uh, based on the timing of when you are planning to do it would you want it to do before you do a clinical fellowship in india or after a clinical fellowship in india my experience would be that after a clinical fellowship in india uh, or wherever you are from once you go to a, an international center you are much better equipped to observe and imbibe whatever you see and put it back into practice here uh, also you know you need to introspect a little more and ask yourselves is it worth it does it add anything to my qualification is it really going to teach me something that i'm going to change what you should not treat this is like another vacation this can really change your life it opens up your uh, horizons to newer practice patterns to a lot of soft skills uh, counseling how to understand how processes and techniques run and then plan and also it's important to apply at the right time typically if you apply say in 2020 or 2021 your fellowship usually would starting date would come sometime in late 2022 or early 2023 so like i said things you should know yourself is what knowledge and skills do you wish to acquire what do you want to be able to do with what you learn there and what are the practical implications of this fellowship upon your return these are not just questions that you need to genuinely know these are actual questions which are in the ico fellowship application form so your answers need to be robust and genuine uh so a little bit of my experience uh, seven years ago i did i went and been a, a short term ico fellow at the new york iron ear infirmary in oculoplastics and they have they have been doing this for over two decades so for them integrating an international fellow was very easy i was immediately put on rotations with on call duties asked to present classes and journal clubs uh, and my mentor was very gracious enough to you know introduce me to uh, other specialists like dr J, uh, dr david abramson who's the father of intravitreal uh, intraarterial chemotherapy at memorial sloan catering i had co fellows from bolivia spain israel so there was a very good group going on and you know subsequently we've been able to connect and stay in touch i have been inducted as an alumnus in the new york iron ear infirmary alumni group and not just that we've already also written multiple papers uh, with co-authors over uh, from um, during my time there and even after that we've collaborated and written multiple papers so it's a long lasting relationship and it is only because of my mentors in uh, the new york iron ear infirmary that i was recommended for a membership into the american society of oculoplastic and reconstructive surgery which has only a handful of indians in it so it can really change your uh, your 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 practice your knowledge and the way you see things uh, so to summarize plan well plan your timing choose wisely because it can help in building your career chart a timeline and also take everybody's opinions into a uh, consideration your family members your employers your partners because these are law, you know important decisions at the end of the day having cleared your ico examinations and having an ico fellowship under your belt is an extremely important and good asset that if you have the opportunity to uh, take it under the when you are under the age of 40 you should go for it thank you if there are any questions because we don't have an interactive uh, you know face to face meeting i'd be happy to take them if you can email them to me at this email address great Your thanks acha uh, you gave a lovely overview of the ico experience both in terms of examinations and fellowships um so then i think without uh, waiting for much longer i'll start off my talk on uh, the frcs examinations nuts and bolts and uh, we can uh, see how it goes from there okay so uh, there are three royal colleges essentially in the uk which are responsible for training and uh, continued education of uh, medical graduates 
The Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, 1505, was the year of establishment. The Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, which was established in 1599. And the Royal College of Ophthalmologists based in London, which, is, which was established most recently in 1988. So as you can see from their uh, crests and seals that they have a very hoary past and uh, they're almost uh, uh, remind us of Hogwarts and other Harry Potter uh, settings. And I'll be limiting my talk to the college in Glasgow, which is the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow. And as I mentioned, it's a lovely uh, city with a medieval past. And also, incidentally, the heart attack capital of Europe, because they have the highest incidence of uh, uh, myocardial infarction. That's a fried Mars bar, a deep fried Mars bar. They, they have a tradition, a culinary tradition of deep frying anything and everything. So that probably accounts for their high rate of uh, cardiovascular mor morbidity and mortality. But you can see some glimpses of the convocation ceremony. I'm starting right at the very end and then proceeding as to how do you reach this point. Um, my study buddy, Dr. Asif Virani and I attended the convocation ceremony with our families. And it was a real uh, lovely culmination of a, an effort which goes on for about three or four years. And you hear a few glimpses of the convocation ceremony with everybody dressed in very colorful robes with a lot of pageantry and a lot of uh, pomp. You can see that over there. So where does the journey start? So essentially the examination is divided into parts. There's a lot of confusion about nomenclature. So let's restrict ourselves to the parts one, two, and three. And the part one is essentially a basic sciences and optics MCQ test. Uh, so I think this is common with, uh, for example, the IC, uh, ICO examination, and there is a cross exemption. That means if you have done the ICO examination part one, you need not appear for the part one of the FRCS Glasgow examination. Part two is further divided into two. It's essentially on clinical sciences, but there, there is an MCQ test as well as a written paper. The MCQ test uh, exemption is possible if you have done the ICO part two, but you uh, have no exemption from writing the written paper. The written paper consists of four questions. Three of them are on ophthalmology and one of them is on general medicine. That's medical emergencies essentially. And uh, that is an important part of the overall philosophy of the examination. You need to finish this. Uh, you need to uh, successfully uh, answer this question before you can complete the second part. So if you answer the other three well and you've passed in those three, but if you fail in the medical uh, general medicine question, you will not clear this part. The third part is actually the most uh, probably interesting and uh, the most uh, exhilarating part, which is the uh, structured oral examination and the clinical examination. These are the viva, in other words, and the clinical examination. So there, there are various sub tables in them and uh, you need to prepare accordingly, of course. Who's eligible? to appear for this examination. Essentially for part one, you just need to have finished your internship plus one year of post-qualification uh, MBBS training, a uh, post-MBBS training. For part two, however, you need to have completed five years post-qualification training of which four and a half years should be in ophthalmology. So there's actually an exemption. If you've done six months in an allied uh, field, for example, anything like radiology or ENT, or you took a uh, took up a residency which you dropped halfway and then joined ophthalmology you are still eligible to show that as part of your training uh, part three essentially needs you to have completed parts one and two successfully so there's no real time limit except for the part two these are the fees that are uh, you know put up uh, as of yesterday on the website every year you will notice that the amounts keep going up and up so part one is um, 350 pounds, part two is 795 pounds, and part three has, the, the, these fees are of the last year because there's currently no clarity on whether part three is being conducted or not in the COVID setting. So um, part three, the, the 1410 pounds that you see over there is actually the fees from last year. So it is something that really can give you a bit, bit of a headache if you don't not only do your academic planning, but also financial planning. Um, the, ex the website very happily tells you that you have a maximum of six attempts for each part, but I think we'll all be quite old and infirm if we take six attempts to complete each part, as well as uh, needless to say bankrupt. 
So uh, you, you would not like to finish the examination in as minimum number of attempts as possible. All of this and more details are given at the website, uh, rcpsg.ac.uk. Of course, you can just Google Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow and you will get to this website, which has all the latest information on exam applications, guidelines, suggested reading, deadlines, the uh, fee structure and everything else that you could ask for. Uh, Dr. Akshay has already touched upon the uh, reciprocity between the uh, Edinburgh College and the International Council of Ophthalmologists. So they have been in partnership since sub September 2018. And uh, I won't be dwelling too much upon that. However, there is now a further clarity on new examinations that allow you to uh, um, uh, qualify for the FRCS. And uh, we'll probably go into that a little later. So this is the flow chart that has already been discussed. And the website for the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh is up there on your screen now. In general, all of these examinations use something called the modified Angoff technique. So this means that these examinations don't have a clear cut uh, uh, pass mark, preset pass mark, for example, 50% or 35% as it is in Indian examinations here the pass mark fluctuates depending upon the difficulty level of the exam. The more difficult an exam is or deemed uh, to be uh, is, the lower the pass mark is set. So an easy exam will have a higher pass mark and a, low, uh, uh, and an easier, uh, a more difficult exam will have a lower pass mark. So it's very nicely uh, done so that it's objective and it helps you to you know uh, really assess yourself amongst your peers, even in the presence of a very difficult exam. So how does one prepare for the examination? Akshay also spoke about this. So clinical, opt uh, sorry, uh, optics, uh, essential reading would include um, uh, the textbook by Elkington, as well as the textbook by Dr. Kurana. Both of them are wonderful in their own right and have their own um, you know, uh, advantages. So I would suggest reading both of these. The part one basic sciences is almost, um, uh, you know, essential to read these two books. The MCQs in basic sciences, uh, ophthalmology part is uh, edited by John Ferris and has wonderful MCQs with answers and the reasons why a particular answer is correct. And if one wants to go into a little more detail, the textbook by John Forrester is also a wonderful read. Incidentally, John Forrester was uh, awarded the honorary FRCS at the same convocation that I had attended. So it was quite an honor. For the part two, essentially the M MS and DNB syllabus is more than adequate. Whichever textbook you wish to read is great. Um, but to assess how well you are doing or how well you may do, the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary Review Manual for Ophthalmology, edited by Jeffrey Lamkin, and there are Indian authors in there as well, have uh, a wonderful series of very difficult MCQs, which could uh, give you some insight as to how you would do in the exam. For the emergency medicine question, as I mentioned earlier, the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine is an excellent book. And it has a section on medical emergencies, which every candidate should be well versed in, including the flow charts and dosages of different medication. So uh, a few tips. Uh, in general, the FRCS examination is a very practical oriented examination. Theory is not tested even in the theory exam. For example, in Indian exams, we're often asked lists of various conditions or the most common causes in, in descending frequency, et cetera. Nothing of this nature is asked in this examination. Uh, it's very practical and most of the questions test your approach to a particular clinical scenario. So one needs to have a very methodical approach and plan one, one's answer prior to setting it down on paper. So the schema that is followed is generally a progression from life-threatening conditions to vision-threatening conditions to something that's purely cosmetic. In the VIVA, in the part three, as I mentioned earlier, there's a VIVA and there's a clinical examination. And the VIVA itself is called a structured oral examination, but it's really a whirlwind and you have these various tables or subsections where you're going to be tested on different uh, systems of the eye. And one needs to, again, pass individually. And uh, you have two examiners at each station asking you in rotation questions that are uh, in the form of a clinical situation or picture. 
it's interesting that these are specific questions and they have model answers. So if you hit the key words on the model answer, there's no reason why you cannot pass. But at the same time, if you try to bluff or bluster your way through, uh, guess, then you probably may go off totally on the wrong track. Some of the examiners, or in some of the examinations, the examiners are instructed to bring you back to the point in the form of a hint, and you should build upon those hints so that you can at least get to a particular level of uh, competence in that answer. Generally, there are sub parts to the question which follow an easy to difficult rule and the subsequent subparts build on the previous answers. So for example, if the first question is, what is your diagnosis? And if you fail to answer the particular diagnosis, the subsequent subparts become even more difficult to answer correctly, at which point the examiner may give you a hint. The clinical examination is where you actually examine patients and there are a variety of patients kept for your examination. And these are the four tables or four um, you know, subsections. Many, many times in Indian examinations, we leave certain uh, subjects for option, as we call it, whether it is squint or oculoplasty. And unfortunately, in this examination, there is no such thing. You have to be well versed in, well -versed in all of these uh, diseases and their examination techniques, because you have to individually pass in all of these substations. In general, the more patients you see, the better, because if you are doing well, the examiner will quickly switch you over to a new patient and give you an opportunity to do even better. Practice pays, and there are various way, ways in which you can practice both on live patients in your OPD, as well as with a friend, and you can discuss how you would examine a particular case or how you would examine a particular disease. Um, even if it's verbal and even if it's totally in your imagination, I would strongly suggest one does at least that because one may not see the classic examination cases in one's OPD for months together. So at least an imaginary um, sort of discussion is also helpful. So what are the advantages of the FRCS? So basically the FRCS exempts you from the PLAB when you, uh, if you wish to emigrate to the UK and hunt for a job there. It does offer better remuneration in the Middle East. Uh, there are different salary structures and sla salary slabs if you have an FRCS degree versus if you don't. Uh, it, is, uh, it may not be lo any longer accepted as a valid degree in ophthalmology. In Singapore and Hong Kong, I would strongly suggest one looks at the current rules when one uh, is trying to emigrate to such places. As I mentioned earlier, there is a cross exemption with ICO, both parts one and two A can be cross exempted. A lot of people just enjoy giving examinations and I was one of them. Uh, it sort of gives you a bit of a, uh, an idea as to where you stand on an international uh, scene. And many of us just like to have more and more letters after our name. We probably don't need to go to this extent, but having something uh, additional that uh, separates us from our peers is also something I think a, a major motivation for giving this examination. However, the examination does have strong disadvantages. It does not, in a sense, allow you to practice anywhere in, the, in, the, in as much as it, it is not a licensing examination and it is very ex expensive. So as I mentioned earlier, financial planning is also required, not just uh, an academic planning, because if you start the process and if you spent money thousands of rupees on parts one and two, and then you find that you're not motivated enough to appear for part three, there are no special prizes for completing parts one and two if you don't complete the third part. So at Lakshmiya Institute, in conjunction with uh, Beyond Eye Care, we run a, an FRCS course, a training course for uh, students and pr prospective candidates. These are a few scenes from some of the previous uh, uh, courses that we've had. Uh, we've done it successfully for four years and last year we had to suspend it because of COVID because the USP of our course is hands-on training with live patients. And that's very difficult in the pandemic situation. We're trying to see how we can resurrect this in the current situation, but anybody who's interested could take down this number over here and or the uh, email address and contact us uh, in the following month so that we could sort of organize something maybe on an online platform that would be useful to prospective candidates. Um, thank you so much for your patient hearing and uh, wish all prospective candidates and anybody who's interested in these type of examinations all the very best.
It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rohan Savant. Dr. Rohan Savant is uh, one of those with multiple degrees after his name, and most of those degrees are of an international scale and level. Uh, Dr. Rohan Savant is, of course, an alumnus from uh, India, but now he's currently settled in the UK in the Isle of Wight, where he is uh, uh, on his way to become a consultant with the NHS. And he's completed all of these aforementioned examinations, but also the FRC oft. And he's going to share with us his experience on that and his experience of uh, a little bit of working in the UK. Thanks a lot, Devendra, for that introduction. At the outset, I'd like to thank yourself and uh, Dr. Rashmi, sir, uh, for allowing me the opportunity to be uh, a part of such an esteemed panel. So um, uh, going uh, further uh, with that lovely introduction, uh, my topic today is uh, FRC OFT and uh, my experience in a nutshell or uh, how to approach the exam. Uh, I would really thank Akshay and uh, Devendra again because they have covered a lot of this um, the stuff required for this examination as well. Uh, so some of these slides and some of the sources might be repeated. Coming to the, the college, uh, the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, as David had mentioned in his talk, um, founded in April 1988, supposed to be the voice of the profession in the UK. Uh, how does it help in terms of um, your career progression? It is considered to be an exit level examination. Uh, it is one of the necessary requirements to be a consultant in the UK. Uh, in brackets, I've written incomplete because uh, it is not the only thing that is necessary. There are other things that need to be um, completed, like hands-on experience, uh, clinical cases, and a lot of surgical experience as well. Now, recently, uh, it provides exemption from PLAP, so you can directly register with the GMC with the FRC of the exam. Um, and there's been a very recent update. Uh, in fact, uh, Devendra was kind enough to share that with me yesterday. Uh, start from 2020 to this exam can exclusively be given in India. There are a few parts that you could give previously in India and a few where you had to travel to UK like I did on a couple of occasions. But now they are planning to um, get the whole examination done exclusively in India. The exam, as with any fellowship exam, is divided into parts. Part one, followed by refraction certificate and part two, which has now been decoupled into written and oral parts. Part one fellowship, uh, you don't need any experience in ophthalmology to apply for the examination. Um, this examination is based on the learning outcomes of the first two years of OST. OST is the curriculum which is known as ophthalmic specialist curriculum, uh, training curriculum in the UK, which is um, being charted and diligently followed and updated on a year to year basis with uh, new inputs from existing consultants and educational supervisors. Um, the exam generally has three steps per year, but these things change often, more so often since the pandemic, things have been changing a bit more rapidly. Uh, maximum allowed is six items for the examination. The format, uh, it's, a, it's a two into two hour MCQ paper of 90 questions each, so 180 questions in total, consisting of one single best answer out of four options. Um, from October 2020, it is now an online proctored exam, so you can take it at home and workplace. Of course, this might change in the near future as uh, countries and uh, uh, situations come out of lockdown. Mm. So this exam can now be delivered uh, over internet uh, to the candidate's computer at the pre-agreed date and time, and there is one hour break in between two papers. Just to give uh, an example of what is expected, uh, with the level of simplicity or difficulty in the way you take it. I'll read out the question for you in regards to optic nerve, which statement is most likely to be correct. The option A, if it is completely myelinated at the time of full-term birth. B option is ensheathed by perineurium, epineurium, and endoneurium. Option C, Schwann cells within the optic nerve responsible for maintaining myelination. And option D is a subarachnoid space is much narrower in the intracanalicular part than the orbital part. The correct answer is, of course, D. Preparation, as you can see, there is an overlap. So any basic science examination, the resources are very, very similar. There is one particular book for, uh, for basic sciences in ophthalmology specific for FRC. It is followed uh, quite closely by trainees over here. But I've gone through that in detail. It was not there when I gave the exam. It is not very different from the other sources. So you can or can 
uh, op as an option to follow it or stick to the other basic sciences books. Textbook, as uh, Devendra mentioned previously, Forrest is a very good source. Um, it is um, like a guidebook. There's a lot of information in, in, in that small space uh, of the pages of books. So you've got to have at least more than one reading to fully comprehend it. And uh, standard clinical optics by Elkington should be more than enough. After you pass the part one, next bit is the refraction certificate. Uh, again, no previous experience in ophthalmology is necessary for you to apply. Generally, three to four sittings per year, maximum allowed six attempts. Now, uh, there is no need for you to give part one first and then refraction certificate. You can give refraction certificate first, followed by part one. So uh, there is no eligibility criteria with respect to these two parts as an overlap. Now, the format of the refraction certificate is uh, an OSCE based or a structural clinical examination based um, with 10 stations. Since December 2020, following the pandemic, um, it is now fully electronic. So there are no patients, there's no paper. You have to um, do your retinoscopies and enter them into an iPad. And uh, these retinoscopies are basically simulated. So they have a high knee retinoscope trainers with hidden trial lenses. And earlier, the exam used to consist of 12 stations. They've reduced it down to 10 stations now. This is an example of uh, an OSCE sitting so as you can see, out of 10 stations, nine stations are simulated retinoscopy stations uh, for uh, the high near retinoscope. So you need to be very well versed with the retinoscopies. After the refraction certificate comes the part two fellowship examination. Uh, you have to pass part one and the refraction certificate to be eligible to sit for this. Um, the part two examination, written and oral, uh, it combines a form of synoptic exit examination. They use several techniques uh, to assess your knowledge. So they are expected, um, candidates are expected to demonstrate your knowledge with the depth and understanding that is expected to be of an independent new consultant in the field of ophthalmology. Trainees uh, in the UK should pass the written or examination before year seven. Training in the UK consists of seven years. It has been decoupled recently, um, which in other words means that uh, a few years back, you had to give the written examination and pass the oral examination immediately following the written examination. If you do not pass the oral, you have to go back and write the written. They have decoupled it now. So once you pass the written, um, you don't need to give that again. There are maximum of four attempts for each, the written and the oral examination. With respect to the written examinations held twice a year, um, of course, these things change. This can again, like a proctored examination, be taken at home uh, quite recently. It consists of two papers, MCQ based, 90 MCQs each, single best answer from uh, four options. Um, two hours each paper and an hour's break in between. Again, this is based on the um, ophthalmic pressure training curriculum. This is a blueprint of uh, the division of the subcategorization of the uh, 180 MCQs that you can expect. Um, it is followed to the number in most of these examinations. So as you can see, um, clinical ophthalmology is divided into um, retina, cataract, and other subspecialties, for example, but there is also some emphasis on pharmacology, 12 MCQs, investigations, and on statistics, epidemiology. So basically it's a, it's a holistic approach. You have to uh, know bits and pieces of everything to get through this exam. An example just given here uh, uh, about uh, the important thing uh, regarding this question is at the bottom of the question, where according to the NICE guidelines, so it is just an example to show that uh, you need to be well-versed with local guidelines followed in the UK with the NICE and the Royal College of Ophthalmology. Another example uh, of, uh, again, just to explain the level of um, difficulty expected uh, in terms of reading needed uh, to answer questions. Going again through the International Victoria Michael Attraction Study Classification System. So just to elicit that you need to be well-versed with the uh, various classification systems and have your knowledge quite up-to-date. Resources, yeah, again, overlap with Kansky. Oxford Handbook on Ophthalmology is uh, quite diligently followed in this country. 
um, and a lot of questions are picked up from that book. Um, I particularly like uh, the um, Moorfields Manual of Thermology. It is a very, very practical book which gives uh, a lot of insight into day-to-day -day practice and a lot of questions can be are picked up from a Moorfields Manual as well because obviously those are the examiners who set the exam papers. Resources, uh, there are dedicated books written for part of FRC of which you can um, look over at Amazon and uh, with each passing year, people who pass exams keep on adding new textbooks. Um, the age-old website of Chua, uh, which is the MRC of is a very, very useful resource um, for this exam. There are other online MCQ resources like idocs.co.uk and off the questions. Off the questions have a specific um, bit for the FRC of examination. I myself used off the questions and found it very useful. Um, emphasis on the Royal College of Ophthalmologists clinical guidelines. Uh, you get questions asked left, right and center, not only in the written part, but also in the oral examination, because those are the guidelines which are followed uh, in the UK. NICE guidelines and ophthalmic service guidance. Uh, all these things are given in detail on the Royal College website, so uh, and they are free to download. Important also is the DVLA, which uh, tests the vision requirements for driving, and you are tested and asked questions, uh, not only in the written, but also in the oral examination. And uh, a brief um, idea about uh, the uh, General Medical Council Good Medical Practice Guidelines. After the part to written comes the part to fellowship oral. You are eligible after passing the part to written. It's held twice in a year in the UK and once in Singapore. Now uh, with the recent changes, I've uh, just um, come across information that it is going to be held uh, once next year in India and probably twice a year after that every year in India. Uh, max four attempts. Uh, once you pass the part to written, you can give uh, the oral examination within the next seven years for a maximum number of four attempts. The structure of uh, part of examination as it any oral examination is divided into structured viva, which uh, generally happens on the Monday and Tuesday of the week. Then OSCE, which is a structured clinical examination on uh, the rest of the days of the weekdays. So the structured viva has five stations, each station of 10 minutes, which are basically CBDs or case-based discussions. Um, so you will be given a, a biometry printout or a HES chart or an electrophysiology printout for examination, for example, and there will be a few questions that the examiner will ask you. These questions are preset with a sequence and they have been marked accordingly. Second station is uh, basically acute ophthalmic emergencies, which they will not be able to test you in a practical face-to-face -face situation. So they will ask you questions based on that uh, with station two and station three. Station four, uh, attitude, ethics, and responsibility. So if you look at the, the list of topics, um, they'll ask you questions related to uh, suspected child abuse, um, medical ethics, consent, confidentiality, duties of a doctor, appraisal. All these things are given in detail on the GMC website. So you need to have a good read of that before uh, uh, going for the practical live examination. Station five is audit research and evidence-based medicine. Um, basically evidence guidelines with the college and the NICE guidelines as well, and also uh, related to driving again. Now uh, I've written, I've said five stations, but there's a number station six here, which is a communication skill station, which is picked up from the OSCE part, where we have uh, actors who um, will interact in between the candidate and the patient and may include um, like history taking for ptosis, history taking for cataract, taking consent for surgery, explaining the risks and benefits, or some form of counseling or advising patients, or uh, dealing with uh, an angry patient's relative for examination. For station one to five, uh, traditionally there is one examiner. For station six, in the, that's a communication skill, you will have two examiners. One is a consultant ophthalmologist and one is a lay examiner or a non-ophthalmic examiner. After uh, the VIVA comes the OSCE. It's um, a breeze through five stations, 20 minutes each, two examiners and uh, three patients or three cases per station. Now this has changed uh, because of COVID obviously. Um, these are now videos only. 
Um, so station five is the anterior segment, station two is uh, glaucoma and lid, then followed by posterior segment, strabismus in orbit, neuroophthalmology, and station six, which is the communication skills, which you've already done in Viva Five. So this is basically a five station, 20 minutes each. Um, I'll just give you an example of the video. This video has been picked up from the college website. So just to um, emphasize what they would expect, so they will start a video like this. The examiner won't say anything. You'll have to look at it carefully. And as you go, you can, as a candidate, start describing what you see. That will help the examiner to know whether you go in the right direction. They can obviously give you a hint if they think that you're not going the right direction to, to uh, get you back on track and ask you questions pertaining. Again, these questions in terms of the patients and in terms of these videos are pre-decided. So there is a sequence of these questions with answers. So all this is done to minimize um, uh, the human factor with the examiner. So it's a very fair way of uh, assessing. Let's go ahead. Um, in terms of uh, a new temporary COVID requirement, because this um, OSC examination is a video examination only, and as I previously mentioned, that they want to see whether you're good enough to practice as an individual consultant, they want to know if your clinical skills are up to date. So what the college has advised is uh, your clinical skills will be assessed beforehand in a clinical setting by a college appointed examiner who will test you for seven clinical competencies. And this needs to be done at your local hospital um, at least two weeks before the examination. You can have three attempts at this uh, clinical assessment and they will examine you for all these things. So you, they'll probably tell you to pick up a nurse from the clinic or another call, you can tell you to demonstrate all these things um, uh, in detail and they'll mark you for that. How to go about, again, with VIVA clinical scenarios, with OSCE, as mentioned previously, practice, practice, and a lot of practices, especially practice the subspeciality uh, clinic patients, for example, strabismus, orbit, neuroophthalmology. Those are the challenging ones because we don't see them day in and day out unless you have a dedicated department and a specialist who deals with patients like that. Again, I am re-emphasizing this, but it is very important that you go through after reading your Kansky and after reading your Oxford Handbook and your Moorfields Manual to read the NICE guidelines, read the college guidelines, read these GMC documents at least. Um, there is a, a very comprehensive uh, good medical practice document. It's given a lot in detail, but it's like a, a novel. If you can just sit on one afternoon and read it, you'll get a fair idea of what they expect out of you. DVLA, which is the, uh, the driving vehicle licensing agency in the UK, um, recent study papers. And in some instances, you may, uh, uh, the candidate is given an advanced notification asking them to read a particular paper uh, for discussion at a forthcoming examination. Also remember, this is an exit level examination. So, uh, in terms of your knowledge and demeanor, a high level of both is expected. Uh, you can't show startled expressions to the examiner as if you have been bowled out or don't show hyper excitability because they are trying to see if you are seeing a patient in a real world where you see a finding and either you get excited or you, uh, uh, or, or you are trying to figure out what it is in terms of trying to memorize differentials in your mind. Um, as I mentioned, they even mark you for facial expressions and your posture and the way you speak. So this is not, the last point is not practicable at the moment, but uh, I'm hoping very soon they'll uh, have face-to-face -face examinations where you would then need to remember to switch the slit lamp off before you answer any questions because they will mark you against it. Again, a common mantra, prepare early, score well. The best way to pass is treat each and every patient which you see in your clinic as an exam case inculcate the good ophthalmic and medical care and day to day practice with skill examination, high level of knowledge and safety. Good luck. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them uh, over phone or on email. Uh, this is a UK number, so you can maybe even WhatsApp me on that and I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thanks, Rohan. There is actually a question in the question and answer chat box. Uh, from Gauri, who says that I have a query, I haven't been able to clear advanced exams. I'm assuming this is ICO advanced exams. Despite two attempts, can you please suggest study material for the same? Rowan, would you like to answer that? 
Well, in terms of what we have already discussed, in terms of what you have um, uh, told, Devendra, I think I myself followed Lamkin for uh, my exam, and it's a very comprehensive book. It gives so much knowledge that I think it's a, the knowledge given in Lamkin is probably a notch higher than what you expect in FISU advanced examination. Again, that's just to do with the theory bit. With the practical bit, the more patients you see, because it's more practical based questions that they ask. Uh, and they have quite a long history, and then they ask uh, answers. So it's very important to try and visualize what they are asked, what they have asked. Imagine that you're sitting in front of a slit lamp and try to go through it, and that will help you answer questions easily. That's what I did, and I, I, I got through in that way. I don't know what's your experience. What would you like to add in that? Dr. Rashmin wants to add something. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, basically, just repeating, but only one uh, point I would like to emphasize. Um, to people for preparing for any of these exams is that most of the time we don't go through not because of lack of knowledge, but lack of applied knowledge. So as in a uh, uh, given information, the way we are used to prepare or, or uh, give it back in the exam is, okay, what are the causes of CME? One, two, three, four, five. What are the causes of papillary one, two, three, four, five. Versus these exams where they, they really, the same papillary or same CME, they would emphasize on specifics. And things that sometimes you miss out, what is the inheritance pattern? Because you need to know so that you can counsel the family accordingly. What percentage of these can be bilateral? What percentage can lead to vision fatigue problems? So these are the, the information nuggets that sometimes you don't concentrate on when you're reading. Uh, and that's what you should concentrate on to clear the exam. I think as Rohan and Devinder mentioned, the reading material, the knowledge remains the same. It's the application of knowledge and expectation of how you reproduce that knowledge is different in these exams versus uh, the exam that we're used to. And, and on that point also, I'd like to share one important tip that Rashmin sir told me, and that has helped me to pass these examinations, all these examinations. What he, when he was trying to, when I was having a discussion with yourself, Rashmin sir, as to how to approach when you look at a particular scenario and uh, you described it beautifully. You said that you look at something, you look at finding, and the first thing that comes to your mind, tell the examiner. So after seeing all this, the first thing diagnosis which comes to my mind is this, this, this. But I also have these things in my mind so that the examiner knows which way you're thinking. And it really helped me with each and each, with every OSCE, with every Viva station that I have given, uh, I have used this technique and it helped me every time. Excellent points. I think we'll move on to our next speaker then, uh, Dr. Krishna Prasad who needs no introduction to the ophthalmic training and uh, you know uh, residency training circles. He is the head of pediatric ophthalmology and glaucoma at uh, the M.M. Joshi Eye Institute in Hubli. And he's also a passionate teacher who is uh, spearheading their um, eye to eye program uh, for residents since uh, more than a decade, if I'm not wrong. Uh, 16 years. Up and 16 running. years, 16 yeah, years, close to two. Yes, and counting, touch wood. So I uh, hand over to Dr. Krishna Prasad to, who will talk about making the most of fellowship training. Thank you, Dev, and uh, thanks the elite panel for again for my inclusion. And uh, so welcome all the postgraduates and the residents for this excellent program. Uh, so far, the discussion has been on the, the jewel in the crown. So basically all these, uh, the post-nominal degrees that you add, the kind of excellence that you uh, acquire. Basically, this has to sit on a head. So I'm talking on that particular thing, the foundation on which the entire edifice of your ophthalmic excellence actually rests. That is your basic training. Usually it is in India or elsewhere. So your postgraduate training as well as your fellowship training, be it even senior residency, how to make the most out of it. So when we see postgraduates and fellows in our career, we find that there is some kind of a lack of application some kind of a planning where they really do not exploit the situation. They are lost in their choices or priorities. So that is the reason why this talk makes sense in trying to, you know, make, trying to help them to make the most of their training. I think these are the best deals. Believe me, whatever you may think of the people who have, I mean, done well in practice and having a lavish life, very good. You know, they've done well in their uh, every aspect of life. You always look forward to but you believe this is the best time where you really can make it constructive, have still fun along with learning. 
So I always say that the triad of success is in acquiring knowledge. The second is about the skills, and the third is the attitude. So the knowledge, skill, attitude triad is something that we actually discuss and how we build upon these three things. I think the knowledge, needless to say, now we are swimming in the ocean of information. I still remember those days of my residency training in RP Center where we would go to those dusty corners of National Medical Library, the adjacent building, and grope in the dark and in the dust to get some information about some rare disease or some particular article, or the textbooks were so scarce, especially the foreign authors' books were so difficult to actually buy. We used to share them, photo, I mean, photocopy them, and get all that some kind of things where there was really a shortage of information. Now there is a, a totally a reverse situation where you are actually confused. There's so much information everywhere and the time is too short. You are two years, three years or four years, whatever training that is allotted, it is too short to gain the kind of knowledge because of the explosion that is happening in every direction. But at the same time, Coming to the pivotal, I mean, the purpose, what is the reason why you get into these books to acquire knowledge? So basically, obviously, the very mundane thing is the materialistic approach is to be employable. At the end of the day, I think everyone has to agree to the fact that when you become an ophthalmologist, you have to be employable, be it in your own setup, be in an institutional practice, be in a corporate setup. You need to be useful to patients, be productive surgically, clinically, make money and, you know, make your patients fine. So that is the whole reason. That is basically the whole purpose of your training whatsoever. So let us not move away from the central focus that the whole idea is to make yourself employable. So any PG or any fellow has to ask himself, is he employable? I think this one question will get the whole you know, direction, will make a course correction. And obviously, knowledge, there are textbooks, more than that, there's a lot of digital information. There are plenty of GBs of information, books in everybody's laptops and iPads, but how many of them really go to that? Actually, there is a problem in plenty. Earlier, we had some set textbooks. I would know from cover to cover, at least that was expected. Now you have 100 books to refer for a particular thing. So you draw probably read none and you will really not be able to quote from, you would even quote the footnotes of our textbooks. Now even you don't know the covers actually, that is the whole problem. And again, this knowledge very importantly has to be relevant and contemporary. See, this is the whole problem. I still had a postgraduate in some problems, in some conference, in some PG program, trying to tell about the details of a limbal ring localization. See, you should understand that limbal ring is nowhere right now the contemporary thing. It is not relevant to the present practice. The whole idea and the things have changed quite a lot. People who read textbooks only, not attend the conference or listen to the mentors, still are confused how to manage a, a, a retinal vein occlusion. Things are changing so fast that you need to keep abreast of what is happening. Like the neovascular glaucoma, even today the PGs know that we need to treat the posterior segment first and then the intraocular pressure. Now, there are a lot of attempts to now treat the glaucoma first with a, a amid glaucoma valve and then treat the posterior segment. So all these things, what is changing? We have the PGs have to be or the fellows have to be, you know, uh, in line with that. And what is very important, it has to be usable and practical. See, that is the whole idea. See, the what information that you learn has to be used. For example, the most important thing is the problem of present day PG teaching. I always, I mean, profess this is that we are absolutely non, non practical in the sense like we have a question in the exam, like what is the etiopathogenesis? What is the treatment of ocular or a clinical features of ocular sarcoidosis? No patient comes with a label on his forehead that he is having ocular sarcoidosis. In fact, we should have a, a, a kind of a, a chapter where sudden vision loss or vision loss. So basically the patient comes with a symptom. We, there is a, actually, we go from the problem. I mean, first we know the problem, then try to know everything about it, the symptoms. In fact, we have to do a reverse engineering. We have to teach our postgraduates and fellows that we start with a symptom and then what is the likely, you know, possibilities and how do you differentiate? How do you investigate? How do you manage? I think if you do this reverse engineering, probably it becomes more usable. 
so we have lot of postgraduate teaching programs in the colleges where there's a seminars given by the postgraduates themselves so obviously this is a, a rote learning they, they download or make powerpoints hundreds of slides is a discussion but there is never actually a reverse engineering technique we never go from a case based discussion in fact we should be discussing cases that is the reason why many of our indian students find it difficult in these exams that has been so far discussed by both dr akshay and dr savan i think very importantly is the knowledge you gain is more practical if you gain it from your mentors and the stalwarts i think the post graduation is no more about teachers that is all over by your medical school under graduation now it's all about mentoring we cannot teach a post graduate anything so he has to acquire knowledge but we can only mentor and show the direction so that is probably very important i think this is very very important because the mentor instills all his experience if a mentor has taken 30 years to gain some particular usable knowledge i think it can be immediately transferred to the post graduate in no time so that is what is so probably the mentor say what is not in the textbook and it is probably a, a very a basic mistake that the pg believes the textbook verbatim it is he doesn't understand there is always an other side of the coin and there there is require a continuous updating and upgrading because the way an expert or a stalwart approach a particular problem is much different than the rote learning that we get in the textbooks and the next thing is the skills i think observational skills i keep it at the top of the list because i see some post graduate i'm doing a surgery somebody is watching it in the theater in the theater and next time he is given a chance he does it so well because he has seen it in the way that if at all a given a chance next time how i will do it probably that is the way he sees it whereas the people who have seen it 10 times don't really pick up the thing so observational skills especially watching and then trying to adapt it so that is probably a very important skill which becomes very useful in and the surgical skills i think today's post graduate training is all about number game people scale or people you know kind of evaluate their surgery their training by the number of cataract surgery so all surgical training is only about cataract there are no other non cataract surgical skills are not taken into consideration and it's always a number that the patient the pgs get into a despair looking comparing the numbers of various institutions whereas they may not really have learned the comprehensive surgical skills so surgical skills is probably very important i cannot it cannot be over emphasized and clinical and diagnostic skill this is important see this is where the real crux of the issue comes when a patient comes to you in practice it is in the outpatient department that you need to diagnose you need to counsel you need to impress the patient then the patient walks into your operating room so this is important so however good surgeon you are it's your opd skills which makes a patient to enter your operating room so that is where the importance of this comes in and i think needless to say communication skills and soft skills that is what sets apart we do not have a curriculum as such we do not have any marks allotted for the communication skills or soft skill training but that become that is a most emphatic thing that decides between a, a successful and not so successful practitioners and of course if you have an exam it's a separate thing by itself we run a program exclusively to train people to pass exams so i know that probably you need to probably set apart some skills how to pass the exam which probably may not include all the other four skills i think here the i i as i probably again well upon the observational skills you need to look at your role models probably you need to look at people how not to be and there are some people how to be so role models who are your role model choose your role models well there are enough now now there are everybody wants to part with their knowledge teach people the present day the in the virtual world we have so many platforms where you can actually directly access the knowledge of the real stalwarts in the field the veterans in the field so if you are in your setup or anywhere else try to look at their how they actually so i have always told my fellows to stand behind a, a senior consultant and just to watch them run the opd they always watch us in the theater but not in the uh, opd opd skills what i call it as a reverse osex i think that is the way we uh, try to evaluate a students outpatient skills their clinical skill in the opd but 
it is the other way around as fellow stand behind me and probably watches me how i manage a particular case because i am trying to put in all my experience all my skills clinical diagnostic communication skills counseling skills into that particular case and that is where they get the most out of when watching people in the operating room of course watching surgeries trying to get the nuance of it see what is important they just watch like i always use the i mean analogy of a korean movie without subtitles if you are watching a, a korean movie without subtitle you just watch it but nothing goes into your head so most people watch exotic surgeries and they are just watching they are not nothing is really getting they are not really in the process of trying to inculcate that surgical nuances and many time they are interested in the exotic surgeries in fact they would have not seen me operating a pterygium with an autograft probably they would have missed out the important steps of a more commonly done procedure they would be watching watch me in waiting to see some rare surgery which i probably do once in a year which may not they may not get a chance to do it in their private practice at all so probably this is something any has to do and surgical skills you have to start early most people have a latency in medical college and they don't enter the theater for 3 months six months they don't start surgery i think you have to start early it's all about you know uh, psychomotor skills you need to get that finesse you need to get that hand eye coordination the earlier you start the better it is for you and the wet lab of course the wet labs are increasing fortunately now but still a wet lab training is something that really makes you ready for the you know to get into the to operate on the actual patients and presently we are plagued with they always say that there is a common complaint that most medical college do not have enough surgical training facilities there is a lack of infrastructure there are no microscopes i think there are always innovation possible i know they do get enough stipend the microscopes are available for hardly 2.5 3 lakhs now i know a medical college where everybody contributed 10000 rupees and bought a microscope apa sami microscope and it was like a share so they sold their shares after one year of they once they passed out to the incoming post graduates so they kind of they had their own microscope in that way they had multiple things commonly used i mean equipments without bothering the management without having to say that we do not have infrastructure i think if you probably have your commitment you can still things will happen and surgically whenever you are doing a surgical skill it's very important you respect the tissue you respect the patient especially on a community set of where we are doing charitable surgeries it's very important that we have to respect that we have been learning and their eyes have been given on a platter to us to practice i think this is the ultimate you know uh, uh, approach of you know humanitarian approach and finally it's the communication skills which takes you through i always say the success lies in the broca's area of the brain you have to watch people how they communicate you have to rehearse in front of the mirror there is nothing harm in that i think dr savan said so well that this is so important in the exams in the western world and in india we do not really give enough emphasis on these things you have to emulate people there are already some set practices just copy paste that you need to enact it before you actually go into the real world and you need to train people how to break the bad news how to counsel cataract patients and how to prognosticate so this is something that's very important clinical skills is about getting maximum information from a patient in a minimum time you don't have half an hour in your busy opd in your real world so the quality and the accuracy of findings that you get is something you need to stress on and again i told you soft skills putting patient at ease the empathetic approach this is where you convert a novice into an expert so that is your journey for any fellow or a post graduate that he becomes an expert from this noviceness i think final the third one is the attitude on which we really do not have anything to contribute your environment your teachers mentors cannot change this you are born with an attitude only you can change this skills we can impart knowledge we can impart the attitude something in born i think so this is where the another triad of you have a head where you have an exemplary contemporary knowledge that is usable by you you have a good hands where you have the enough surgical skills the finesse to really impart the uh, the uh, well justified treatment to the patient in terms of surgeries and procedures and a heart which really you know makes a patient comfortable you have to be empathetic and see that when you really mean something the patient actually get those vibes and you will be able to actually communicate that to the patient that you actually are wishing for his well being 
so this triad of heart head and hand combination is a sure shot success for our post graduates so thank you very much and all the best for your future thank you sir uh, wonderful as always inspiring for everybody at any stage in their career uh, i'll uh, you know we're uh, getting to the end of the session but i'd love now to introduce uh, dr rashmin gandhi uh my personal inspiration for a lot of my career choices and he has now taken a branch in his career since the last few years that has uh, taken him out of his comfort zone into something totally different and i would like him to sh share his experience and his thoughts on how do i plan my future after residency uh, i think he's the best to speak on this topic dr ashwin over to you sir you are muted uh, thank you so much for uh, for this invitation and we have been doing this course for last 4 5 years and it's always a pleasure to be part of it so uh, quickly go on to uh, after listening to all this frcs ico fellowship what is it what is the path that i would take or uh, how do i decide after my training should i pursue a, a fellowship should i write any other exam uh, as a career choice should i join a trust hospital corporate hospital start a private practice so these are the general options that we have once we are at the end of our training it be residency or fellowship so the first question and i think this was emphasized by uh, kp and uh, the other speakers as well is is to ask yourself what is the present status of training and you also have to understand that with this last one and a half years covid uh, taking away a lot of your clinical and surgical time uh, this question has become even more important uh, there are guidelines which have come from uh, cfmg uh, from the us board which uh, lets you objectively evaluate the current status of the training but as far as we are concerned in ophthalmology uh, you need to ask yourself can you do cataract surgery can you handle all the complications of normal cataract surgery and are you aware of the potential complications of a, a, a little deviation in cataract surgery or let's say you're dealing with a cataract with pseudo exfoliation do you know how to handle it so if the answer is yes you know that the surgical part for a complex of thrombology you have uh, you have reached there the second part and kp again emphasized it is your opd skills are you able to do good refraction are you able to manage all the the common uh, conditions that you will see in your opd and at the same time are you able to have your antenna up uh, for the red flags during your routine opd to make sure that you don't miss out on something which might be serious but coming uh, with an innocuous presenting symptom so if the answer again is yes that you know that your comprehensive training has been fine you have achieved what you should be achieving as a resident then the question comes in should you go for fellowship and if so what fellowship i mean obviously the favorite uh, uh, with lot of people would be either cataract uh, cornea cataract refractive or retina uh, we have now great institutions offering this training all across india and uh, the training standards are very high uh, almost in all other all these institutions then there are other other avenues as well because the uh, title of the talk is thinking beyond so what about let's say a fellowship in uvr neuro ophthalmology obviously these kind of uh, specialties offer you a good intellectual satisfaction because uh, you have to work up each patient is a is a different patient and you spend a lot of time to come to a conclusion about what is really affecting the patient and both these specialties also offer uh, a window to uh, the body because a lot of the disorders that we deal with here would have some connection with something going on in the blood or central nervous system or a rheumatological system so that way it is satisfying but obviously uh, 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 these specialties have also become uh, dependent on investigations and a financial aspect a practical aspect employability as krishna prasad mentioned also is question so in other words the hot favorite fellowship uh, programs are already uh, are sought after and then there is there are avenues to pursue some of these off beat uh, specialties as your career choice what about uh, starting uh, the job or working where would you like to work so if your mental map and this is just a representation looks like this where you know you you belong to a, a non metro city or you want to settle in a non metro city 
and money forms an important part of your thought process, then uh, private practice would be a, a good way if you know that your training allows you to go into practice directly. While if you want to settle down in a city or a metro, the money forms an important part of uh, your thought process, then a corporate hospital, again, if you're well trained, would be a way to go. But if money is not the most important factor in your thought process, and you also would like to derive it, like satisfaction, academics, research, then a fellowship and, an, and a job in an academic environment is what you're looking for. What about other exams? FRCS, uh, Devendra and Rohan have covered this beautifully, but you need to also make sure that if you're writing these exams, you, and as we discussed uh, during the question answer session, you need to make sure that you listen to examiners, uh, instruction to you very carefully and make sure that if in the non-COVID era when you are dealing with the patient, you need to make sure that the patient's comfort is of paramount importance. Uh, these exams let you concentrate on vision-threatening and a life-threatening problems which can be associated with an ophthalmic condition and it gives you an insight into an applied knowledge. How do you use these FRCS uh, exams? Well, it is now you can register with MCI as a postgraduate with uh, your FRCS exam. Uh, and in India, probably you, get, you will gain some advantage if you are applying for fellowship in an institution because it tells you that it tells the, the interview board that you have an inclination towards pursuing academics. In Singapore or UAE, uh, now uh, the rules have changed. Uh, a lot of these uh, exams, unless you have a training in UK or US, they don't offer you as much advantage as it used to offer, let's say, 15 years ago. So we've talked about private practice, medical college, institutions, corporate hospitals. These are the way to go after your training is over. A private practice is also a very satisfying and a good platform uh, because you have complete control on the processes, the way you want to set it up, how you want to treat your patients and on your time. But you need to also understand that uh, the present day private practice is, is a 24 hours job, at least in the first decade, and you require a lot of capital money uh, to start the practice because it's now equipment and technology driven practice. The good point is that there is a lot of money which is floating around if you have a, a clear cut idea as to how you're going to start a practice and develop it, you will have uh, support from uh, banking institution, non-banking institutions, uh, and even uh, venture capital if you have a, a, a big ideas. So ultimately, finally, when you are planning your future, it boils down to what excites you. And uh, would give you some examples, and a lot of these examples are part of our course today. Let's say, for example, Devendra, who uh, who has always been in academic environment, but now he's building an institution in a private practice, uh, completely in a non-institutional space. But he still keeps in touch with his passion, that is academics. He conducts all these academic programs even in his private institution. Similarly, uh, Akshay, who is our uh, co-faculty was always interested in octoplasty, always interested in publication. And at each point in time, at each milestone of his career, he never lost sight of these two. And he used his, his ecosystem. And, and currently with before mycosis, he has done such a wonderful work. He has, he has dealt with so many patients. And um, I would just like to highlight one tweet which I came across on a Twitter where some random patient required an infotericin B injection and look at the people who, has, who he has tagged in his tweet. He has tagged uh, Madhya Pradesh Chief Minister, Prime Minister of India, Ames, and Akshay Nair, because he, through the social media, realized that he's one of the person who's dealing with uh, of the in a big way. Look at Dr. Rohan Savan. Uh, he, he was, he's very well trained, extremely good in his clinical skill. And then he wanted to try out something else. Uh, and his adventure, the spirit of adventure, Took him to Ethiopia. He worked with us in Ethiopia. He built an institution there. He ran it beautifully and successfully. While never lost sight of his primary goal, which was to pass the Royal College exams. And while he was working and uh, absorbing that new culture, he also continued to work on his uh, on his on his main focus. Passed his FRC off, and now he is in UK doing very well. So, in other words, there are these real life stories where you, if you know what you really what excites you. And if you follow that lead, in most instances, you will be successful. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. You, you uh, summed up, I think, the entire uh, ethos of this course uh, very succinctly.
and i think we've just running out of time so i i will now uh, happily conclude this session with thanks to all our wonderful uh, uh, speakers and uh, they've you know this course has been a feature of uh, aios after aios as well uh, individual trainings as well so uh, once again thanks to the ioc uh, organizing committees and uh, all my co-speakers and all the participants as we've mentioned our email addresses you're most welcome to uh, contact any one of us individually if you have any questions or further clarifications needed thank you one and all thank you thank, thank you, you thank you thank you, thank, you thank you speakers for such an informative session have a great day here thank you once again everyone. thank you doctor for thank finishing you. up thank you. thank you so much